And this way, if you bombard it, there's a certain chance that you can bounce back. As Rutherford said at the time, it was like shooting a cannonball of a sheet and having some bounce back at you. So that's the birth of the nuclear atom that we all accept today. Now, after that, shortly after that, Bohr theory, Bohr, Niels Bohr, who also won the Nobel Prize, came out with a theory for how do the electrons move around these nuclei. And it's just as you described. And yes, that happens. And yes, 15 years later, electron spin was discovered, and that, that adds to it too. But also, about 15 years later, quantum mechanics was developed. And so the picture of an electron in an atom is no longer that of something orbiting, but rather like a wave that's occupying that region. Now, it's not as though the old theories have been entirely abandoned. You can see seeds of the old theory, in, and you can see uh, in the new, and you can see developments that were made that tried to bridge the old and the new, and showed how the new could be related to the old, and so on. So the picture that one has nowadays of electrons in an atom is more of a cloud around a small nucleus, you see, with certain properties, spins, and all that. And interestingly enough, in the type of treatment that I gave, all of that is taken into account. So, yes, if a theory is to be correct these days, it has to be based on modern electronic structure theory. And indeed, and it was not, that part wasn't difficult at all, it was, indeed it was possible to phrase things, the electrostatics and so on, the motion of the electrons and so on, to phrase things so as to be consistent with the latest understanding of electronic structure theory. So yes, things w went around in the classical days, in the quantum days, that's no longer true. Uh, one doesn't use that description of the motion, one uses a wave kind of, a mixed wave particle description, but life goes on and so, but the theory itself is consistent with While dealing with the chemical kinetics, uh, uh, temperature dependence on the rate equation first went off given, given an equation. About the temperature dependence of the rate equation. First went off given an equation, it contains three constants. And after that, uh, 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 went off student and his, uh, and Arin is given, uh, uh, given, given equation. But Van Taff's equation gives good results when compared to Arrhenius' equation. Yeah. But nowadays, we are using Van Taff, Arrhenius' equation than Van Taff's equation. Why is it? Yeah. yeah, very good question. And we've actually written some papers on that. Um, yes. Dear Mrs. Yes. Mrs. Yes. yes, let me elaborate. The Arrhenius' equation as every one of you English majors in the audience knows, the Arrhenius equation expresses the rate of the rupture. And normally, the rate of most reactions increase exponentially as you increase the temperature, it increases very rapidly. And Arrhenius developed an equation, I think it was around 1887, called the, now called the Arrhenius equation, that gives the rate of the reaction and its dependence on temperature, and it's in an exponential form. Now that seems standard. But if you look back at the times, look at some of the papers around that time, those of you interested in history, you'll see there are various equations that were tried beside the Arrhenius equation. This is the Arrhenius equation, the one out. Now if you take the expression that I derived, rate constant, K, equals some exponential, and there's a quadratic and things like that, it turns out you can define the properties that occur in the Arrhenius equation from that equation. Because the activation energy that occurs in the Arrhenius equation, if you look at its basic definition, it's related to derivative of the rate constant with respect to, well, 1 over the temperature. So it has a precise definition. And similarly, the factor 
that's the pre-exponential factor in the Arrhenius equation. So both factors, the energy of activation is the call that appears in exponential and the factor that appears in the pre-exponential, both of those things can be evaluated in terms of the theory. In other words, we wrote a theoretical expression, we can rewrite it in an Arrhenius form and say something precisely about the constants that appear in the Arrhenius equation. So the two are entirely consistent. It's just that this gives far more detail. The Arrhenius equation is a wonderful equation for representing how the rate of the reaction depends upon temperature. It in itself doesn't provide any insight because it doesn't tell you theoretically what the exponentials to be or what the pre-exponentials to be. But it's a wonderfully convenient way of describing the equation, the rate and its dependence on temperature of many reactions. And what the theory 